All right. Okay, thank you everyone. I'm so sorry for the delay. Uh, finally, we have our interpreter with us. And uh, once again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of us. Uh, today, we are going to talk about uh, deaf mental health. And uh, we are lucky to have Dr. Joyce Wangari Ngogi with us. As uh, we all know, she's a consultant, a psychologist, and a research mentor. And um, she's also my mentor. I've known her for a very long time, back when I was in Kenya, and now that I'm here in Liberia. My name is Mary Sharon Mwango. I'm from Migori, Kenya, and uh, I'm a special needs uh, deaf educator. Uh, I'm working with a program here in Liberia. Liberia. And uh, apart from uh, teaching, I'm also working with different organizations to make sure that uh, all uh, our children are able to get uh, education and also uh, their rights uh, be advocated for. Uh, I'm going to uh, give Joyce uh, a chance to be able to introduce herself before we start. Thank you. Just listen. Thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, for your wonderful facilitation. It's always a pleasure, Sharon Wango, to work with you. And you're doing an amazing job teaching deaf children in West Africa, you know, in Liberia. And uh, your organization, Hope for Deaf Children, is really doing great work. And of course, our in-house sign language interpreter, Kaziri Eid for her many, many, many opportunities of uh, offering her amazing work. Uh, she also works with deaf families and she's an advocate uh, of the uh, law courts of Kenya. So I'm really, really honored to be in your presence today. So uh, a little introduction about how I came to this work is in my family, I have had family members who have hearing disability of different kinds. I also have worked with um, many deaf children and deaf adults in schools and in the community. So when I arrived at uh, the point of choosing a topic for my doctorate research, I decided to actually focus on mental health in deaf people. My program that I studied is clinical psychology at United States International University, USIU, Africa. And it is actually based in Nairobi. I have also been privileged, as I said earlier, to partner with wonderful journal club members such as Sharon here, all the way from Liberia, as well as um, Kaziri Eid in journal club and many other people working with the deaf. And uh, today I'll, I'll be happy to explain the science behind my work in a way that somebody with a little or no scientific background would understand why, why we focus on deaf mental health. And of course, I'll be very keen on also highlighting the longer term implications of the research I did for my doctorate. For example, how this kind of research could affect people's lives in say five years or 10 years time from now. So before I also proceed, I would like to sincerely thank Ada Africa Journal Club. The team has given me a lot of solidarity in ensuring the completion of my doctorate degree. So I'm really, really honored. I can see a lot of the Ada Africa Journal Club members here. And it's always my pleasure to have conversations on how to help each other through research. Thank you. Thank you. I can see uh, in the chat, there's someone who, uh, the sign language, uh, they're not able to uh, see the video. Ah, okay. So that means that uh, we need to spotlight and Kaziri Eid. And also you can type in the chat that if yeah. anybody is using a phone, that they need to pin the video of the sign language interpreter. Her name is Nkaziri Eid. So let me know if people have gotten that message. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, 
maybe we can start because uh, I can see we have limited time. And uh, my first question to you is, uh, can you give us an overview uh, on your doctorate, do doctorate research on deaf mental health? Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. So I also forgot to say that I am the founder and co-director of Guira Foundation. Guira is a Rwandese word meaning kindness, and I can see my co-director, uh, Koi Benji here. Thank you, Koi, for being here. So we've done quite some work in the field of deafness, but today I'm here to talk about my research. And the topic was the relationship between psychosocial support concerns and depression among deaf adults in Nairobi and Kajiado counties of Kenya. So my research basically focused on three objectives, describing the psychosocial support concerns that deaf people face. And number two, the second objective was to actually identify and examine the presence of depression symptoms in deaf adults and their severity, you know, is it mild, is it severe? And thirdly, the third objective was to determine the association between the psychosocial support concerns and depression. And actually my study found that yes, there was a significant positive correlation of psychosocial support concerns with depression at 0 0.225, which also highlighted one of the concerns, especially home management was significantly associated with depression. So my study was basically on deaf adults' mental health access barriers that are a result of societal inequality and discrimination. And, uh, out of my doctorate research, uh, there were several implications. One is that there is a big need to design deaf-friendly assessments in order to check for mental health concerns such as depression and other things and other conditions. Another one is that the study recommended deaf-centered interventions so that we have the deaf designing and implementing mental health counseling assessments and interventions and for further study my study also recommended a national census in all the counties we have 47 counties in kenya my study had only examined two counties nairobi and kajiado so i also recommended a national census on deaf mental health and development of instruments that are normed for deaf populations in Kenya. So that's a nutshell of my study. And uh, mine was a sequential mixed methodology. So I had questionnaires to check for depression and psychosocial support concerns. I also designed my own semi-structured interview and group, focus group discussion guide. So it was really interesting to get the in-depth experiences and mostly the content analysis revealed a lot of concerns around family, uh, you know, those personal relationships that the deaf have. Socioeconomic welfare was a big problem. There's a problem of poverty and in access to, you know, adequate capital, therefore mental health will suffer. And of course, stigma, those were the top most concerns out of my study. Um, I've tried to summarize it as much as possible, but I will also share the link to my actual dissertation so that you can uh, read it at your own time. Thank you. Thank you. The link uh, will be of great help to most of us uh, because uh, your research is uh, really good and uh, it can really help most of us that are doing the special needs education to also know how to do our research and know uh, what our topic can be. Yeah, so my second question to you is, uh, what does the word deaf refer to? And uh, to you, how do you, uh, how can you say like uh, the mental health, what is the meaning? Because we really have different types of meanings and uh, in our, in our, uh, in our research and also in uh, the special needs education, how can we, uh, how can we say like, uh, what is the meaning of uh, mental uh, health? Yeah, yeah, and the meaning of death. 
yeah, yeah, I like that you asked the question about the word deaf because many people think it's not an appropriate word, but actually deaf is a positive word which refers to people who ascribe to deaf culture. So deaf community culture comprises all the individuals, organizations and institutions that ascribe to deaf culture. So the word deaf means people who have a complete inability to hear or partial inability to hear, uh, people who use a signed language rather than a spoken language, and people who may have similar education history, cultural history, and a psychosocial history. So it's a psycholinguistic um, term, the word deaf. And uh, deaf with a small d, however, just means anybody who may not have uh, the sense of hearing. So remember, deafness is a condition which may be hereditary or acquired by injury or disease. So when we go to mental health, most of us here who are in the field of mental health already know what the WHO says mental health is. It's a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his abilities, can cope with normal stress of life, work productively, and is able to make a contribution. So when we talk about deaf mental health, what we really are talking about is the mental health of people who are deaf. So is the provision of counseling, therapy, and other psychiatric services to people who are deaf and hard of hearing in ways that are culturally aware and linguistically accessible. I think I'll highlight the culture and the language because um, it's a highly specialized field and deaf mental health also covers, of course, research, training and services. It's a multidisciplinary field. Uh, so that we are able to improve the mental health of deaf people. So in a nutshell, I would say those are the um, definitions. L let me also add that my study used two main philosophies. One, the cultural model of deafness as defined by Dr. Andrew Foster. Dr. Andrew Foster is considered the father of deaf education in Africa. And in the year 2001, he actually talked about the cultural model of deafness. So the deaf people may not always necessarily see themselves as having a disability, but they belong to a unique culture. So that was one. The other philosophy for my study was the transformative disability advocacy paradigm of the 21st century postmodern philosophy, which actually is about intersectionality. So we have to look at multiple pathways in which deafness and mental health can coexist or different factors such as you know the deafness severity level deafness type gender age race ethnicity all these things marital status occupation can interplay to create the psychological distress of deaf people so this transformative uh, element actually is a social justice approach because we are saying that uh, my study seeks to transform societal attitudes towards the deaf people. So if I may ask any member of the audience, have you ever employed a deaf person? Why or why not? So I, I'm very curious to know whether you're deaf or not, whether you're deaf or hearing and you're in the audience today. Um, I want to see if you, you would employ a deaf person if, if you had a job to give them and why or why not just you know to jog our our our, our thinking a little bit so mm. i'm very interested in how deafness and mental health interact thank you welcome uh thank you it's funny in my school uh, we are only three hearing the rest we have employed uh uh persons uh who are having had uh of hearing or others have partial hearing. So at the first time I came to work here, it was really hard for me. I had to learn a new American sign language, which was a great experience. And uh, uh, it's good, it's always good to create uh, employment opportunities uh, for people uh, and also for uh, other, uh, how can I say it, here in Liberia, uh, we are trying to uh, encourage uh, the students to 
be able to join university and also continue their higher education. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much, uh, Joyce. Uh, my other question is, uh, does being uh, deaf uh, automatically result in a mental disability? Oh, that's a really interesting question. So you know that being deaf is not a mental disability. In fact, many people think people who cannot speak or cannot hear are mentally unstable just because they cannot speak. That um, you'll find people using inappropriate words like dumb or mute. These are bad words, they increase stigma, shame and suffering. So being deaf does not automatically result in a mental disability. However, there are many societal barriers and in the environment, there are many obstacles that lead to a lot of suffering of deaf people, which then can lead to a mental disability or a mental condition such as depression. So social factors are the most prevalent cause of mental suffering for those who are deaf. Only a few will suffer from genetic causes. So as you know, some deaf people are born uh, maybe with a neurological condition that results in deafness, or they may have a more complex genetic problem that leads to multiple difficulties, such as deafness, along with maybe a different uh, condition like an intellectual disability or another physical problem, such as visual problem. We know now we have another group called the deaf blind who actually use tactile communication. These are people who cannot see and cannot hear. Some people are born with balance problems or organ damage, you know. All of these, of course, will carry their own increased mental health risks. You know, the more physical um, conditions one has, the more the risk of a uh, mental uh, disability. But we know that deafness in itself is classified under physical disabilities. It actually is a disability because there are many ways that people who are deaf may not be able to fulfill life activities because of barriers in the environment. So as I said earlier, the deaf community takes a very different view uh, because while we see them as having a disability, they just see themselves as being different and they celebrate deafness as a cultural identity. Um, if anybody knows how many national languages we have in Kenya, I'd like to see the answer in the chat. How many national languages do you think we have in Kenya? And which ones do you know uh, are our national languages? Uh, let me know if we have any chats coming for that question. And the other question I asked earlier is, is whether anybody would hire a deaf person. So I, I, I'm asking this um, because of what I just mentioned, uh, deafness being a linguistic and cultural identity. So do we have Anybody who knows how many national languages are in Kenya? Shara, back to you. Okay, thank you. If you know the answer, please uh, put it in the chat. Oh, there's one I can see. Uh, Macau Wanza uh, said uh, there, is a, there are four, Swahili, English, Kenyan Sign Language, and Braille. And for Edward, uh, he said English, Kiswahili, and uh, Kenyan Sign Language. Uh, Sharon ah. has said English, Swahili, and uh, Kenyan Sign Language. Uh, I see our audience are very aware. The correct answer is three. Um, yeah. English, Swahili, and Kenya Sign Language. So uh, the deaf people have a national language, you know, that's unique to Kenya. Ken and sign language and that's why I say they see themselves as having just a cultural linguistic difference or diversity all right Please yeah continue. okay and uh, how does mental health conditions affect deaf people and uh, what are the signs and symptoms deaf people are more likely to experience mental health problems as compared to hearing people such as anxiety and depression uh, they are twice as likely to suffer from these conditions. Sadly, the only estimates that we have of mental health concerns of deaf people are based on rates of mental illness in the general population. So they extrapolate and estimate 
how many people who are deaf would actually suffer. We don't have any targeted research that is national yet that can tell us how many deaf people have which kinds of conditions. So unfortunately, I may not have those statistics. And that is actually why my research is important in order to stimulate the conversation at a national level so that we get to know which people in which counties need what kinds of care. So, but we know that overall in the world, about a quarter of deaf individuals have additional disabilities, as I mentioned earlier, like blindness and other kinds of conditions. And they have a high probability of complex mental health needs. And uh, there was a very major study done in the year 2012 by The Lancet. The Lancet is a prestigious global journal and Dr. Johannes Fellinger said that deaf people are twice as likely to have mental health problems as people in the general population. Now, if you look at that statistic and look at the barriers in accessing care, then you will see why uh, the issue of deaf mental health is more than urgent. Recently, there was a very interesting feature on deaf mothers. Uh, maternal yeah. mental health of silent mothers mm -hmm. that I also wish to share in the link. Uh, this actually was a feature on KTN News yesterday by one colleague of mine, Judy, who's working with deaf mothers, which highlights, you know, the experiences of people accessing care and how they get so stressed and there is nobody to talk to. So uh, these are the kinds of initiatives that we wish there would be more and more of every day. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, do you, uh, how uh, maybe like uh, personality disorders? Uh, how does uh, that uh, does it affect uh, the deaf persons, most of students? Yeah, that's a really really good question. So many people will misdiagnose uh, deaf people as probably having a certain uh, personality disorder. Well, mo in most cases, it is just that they are um, asserting themselves. You know, uh, so we know that there are typical mental health concerns I mentioned too, anxiety and depression, there's also a lot of trauma. I would not say that personality disorders are the biggest concern, you know, for this population, but I would say mostly there are those ones where, you know, they've suffered being isolated and being bullied or being yeah. abused because prejudice and feeling stigmatized does lead to mental health suffering and most of the time it's not just a deaf person as an individual but along with their families so in addition yeah. they may not enjoy early intervention or proper diagnosis so and then they have the linguistic barrier whenever they are in any encounter so they'll experience a lot of crisis even within the encounter of you know getting psychological help so of course being forced to have a different linguistic identity in a world full of people hearing and speaking everywhere, that leads to a lot of language deprivation. So you can imagine how that would compound problems in social settings. So just think about in your life today, if you suddenly became um, soundless, there was no sound around you, but everybody is still drawing their lips up and down, you know? They're still talking yeah. and they still force you to follow how actually that would affect you. So sometimes for the hearing people, we may ignore how much suffering that goes, but it actually permeates, you know, to every area of their life. Can you hear me? Uh -oh. Okay. Uh, the typical mental health Uh, 
I think your video is buffering. I'm not sure if it's just me, but maybe you can switch off your video uh, so that we get the sound clearly. Um, kindly come again. That's compared to the children. Okay. So actually, uh, yeah, it's okay. I got the question. Thank you. So you okay, asked, uh, you know, the typical. What are the typical mental health concerns among deaf adults as compared to deaf children? Yeah, so deaf children are more likely to be isolated, bullied, and abused. Um, especially where they have to attend integrated schools and they are the only deaf child in the class. They suffer a lot of pre prejudice and stigma and they may not enjoy early interventions for language development in their natural language, which is sign language. Therefore, they may experience a lot of transition crisis. So uh, because of linguistic delays, they experience a lot of psychosocial difficulties. And um, we've had of a lot of uh, all cases of sexual abuse as well. Uh, a lot of deaf children not able to even access school because families search far and wide for special schools and may not afford the additional cost of accommodating a deaf child. So such issues of language deprivation will compound problems in social settings, as I said earlier. And of course, deaf identities may mutate over time because as I said earlier, you can have a variety of differences in the hearing loss, maybe mild hearing loss becomes more severe over time. And sometimes it's only one ear affected, what we call unilateral or bilateral, both ears are affected. So that also may change over time. So in terms of age, children and adults may have changing needs over time. But usually the most important thing is the social dominance orientation. In other words, which language does the family choose for the identity of the child? Is it the hearing language where you know people's spoken language is favored over the signed language? Or you know, uh, is it the deaf uh, identity where you know sign language is favored? And so you'll find uh, children also struggling with identity issues because they neither fit into deaf or hearing worlds. And because the most deaf children have hearing parents, they become culturally marginalized in that way. So. Um, children have that very unique um, presentation in clinical settings. For adults, we assume that there has been adequate socialization through deaf schools and uh, adults who become deaf while being, while still adults may still have transitional crisis, you know, and anger and resentment towards hearing people who most of the time, you know, will see it as a bad omen or, a caste. So this bicultural identity that is held by individuals who are deaf and have to operate in a hearing world can be very uncomfortable. Some people may be able to navigate easily and negotiate them, this context, both behaviorally and emotionally. But for most people, it is actually quite unfair, you know, to be a, uh, to, to, to have um, many contexts, settings, environments in Kenya not um, adequate or, or not, not fit for deaf people. And so their concerns will always be there. And we hope that uh, a lot more can be done. Recently, we've seen a rise in sign language interpretation in the TV stations. And we hope that there's so much more that can be done, even just awareness on mental health concerns so that uh, deaf adults and deaf children can begin to identify, you know, what kinds of things are affecting them and step up and actually can get help for that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, my, next, my next question is, uh, are deaf people able to adequately access mental health care services? Not no. only in 
all over? Unfortunately, universally and in Kenya, access is not yet adequate. And access is a big word that is spoken about a lot in the deaf community. Access has five factors. Affordability, accessibility, relevance, timeliness, you know, um, and the idea of, you know, effectiveness. So is it adequate? is access adequate no it is not we don't have enough uh, formal and informal sources of help for distress you know is it affordable hardly ever um issues such as finding interpreters uh, or being unable to communicate directly with counselors may require the government funding and right now as we speak we only have very few interpreters and these are people who actually have studied a course and will charge for their services. We are very lucky at uh, Ada Africa, we can get a volunteer to spend you know, their time, but that's a professional service. And these kinds of problems affect fast and effective support. Then we don't have relevant support in terms of uh, very, very specific deaf mental health services. And of course, they're not timely because the time taken for a deaf person to actually access and find somebody of their choice is a big, big problem. So all of these factors are um, still affecting the quality and access of mental health care services. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, and uh, what is the quality of uh, mental health support for deaf people? The quality is really low. There is hardly any competence being measured, being ensured. We do not have a regulated body of sign language interpreters as well as deaf mental health providers. We need continuing professional development courses to ensure competence throughout their careers. Then of course, mental health support is unregulated. Mostly in Kenya currently, it happens in little pockets of privately funded programs. And there's also a lot of rampant abuse. You see in cases of uh, little regulation, then anything goes. And uh, we've seen unfortunate cases where uh, deaf people were seeking help and actually came out worse. And so um, my organization has partnered with the government, uh, churches, other religious institutions, and we have been try to avail video phone services, you know, providing interpreters, captioning apps, you know, promoting Kenyan sign language, uh, so that to begin to raise the quality of mental health support. During COVID, we had a COVID blessing in quotes in terms of there was a lot more talk about the need for mental health. And so the National Council of People with Disabilities enlisted providers throughout Kenya in every county who can provide support for deaf people. I hope that they will produce a report soon on what was found out and I'm in touch with them to see that uh, the work that we did throughout the country does not just go to waste, but that can inform you know, better quality next time. So I know we are already at the top of the hour, but I hope we can still be here a few more minutes. Yeah. Uh, since we started yeah. Late. Yeah. yeah, we have been given a few more minutes and uh, I can see you also have questions in the chats. Uh, maybe we'll uh, get to the questions later. Uh, my next question is, uh, are there enough healthcare workers who know sign language proficiently? No, unfortunately, uh, those who are proficient in sign language have not undergone specialized training in healthcare interpretation. And uh, then there is a big number who know basic sign language, but may not always be available when needed. The tragedy of having a nurse, for example, in a hospital who knows sign language is sometimes the nurse is needed for the general population. And so there is need for exclusive interpreters, including uh, hearing interpreters who, who know sign language and deaf interpreters who can convey local signs into standardized sign language for patients or clients who are accessing healthcare. Healthcare workers also need continuing education. It's not enough to just train people one time. 
and then assume that they are proficient in sign language. There's a lot more that goes into capacity building. You know, there's a myth now that people think, oh, if we just provide sign language interpretation, then the issues of the deaf are sorted. Actually, there is need for a lot more capacity building in terms of stigma reduction, uh, awareness raising, and things like that. Thank you for that. And uh, how can we raise awareness on deaf mental health? I believe a forum such as this, with the wonderful work you're doing out in Liberia, uh, this help to destigmatize and to invest in the deaf community. We have not done adequate investment in targeted interventions. So we need to raise awareness through promoting Kenyan sign language, providing adequate sign language interpreters, and then using apps which have captioning. Now with technology, we are very lucky because the deaf community are very famously well known as being early adopters of technology. So, so long as we can avail smartphones with apps for real-time virtual communication, uh, therefore we can ensure, you know, awareness on mental health. There has also been unique issues with COVID, uh, such as interpreters not being allowed when deaf patients need help in inside hospitals when they're admitted with COVID. There was a big problem with that. And we need to include technology to ensure virtual visits so that you can actually have a video call and communicate, you know. Then there's, there's the issue of face masks. And I have only seen one place in the world where there is a clear face mask that is transparent so that uh, deaf people can actually follow how uh, people are using lip reading when communicating. So we also need informational support such as visual signage and communication boards that are audiovisual. Imagine sitting at the lobby or reception of a doctor's office and the only announcements for the next patient are on a speaker. So you can imagine how much uh, deaf people will even miss just booking an appointment. Information, basic information like on the changing nature of COVID vaccines, for instance, needs to be availed. And then stigma reduction, that's a very big deal. Uh, we need deaf culture training and policies that are actually being implemented. We have very robust policies in Kenya, but we are not yet promoting them and implementing them enough. So I would say that we haven't done everything. We, we are somewhere, we are not so badly off in East Africa, I think we are leading, but uh, we still have a long way to go bottom line to ease the suffering and to end uh, suicides and deaths in the deaf community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have two questions. One from uh, Damaris Kanana. Uh, are deaf people at risk of falling culprits to substance use disorder? If yes, what are the statistics? Thank you so much, Kanana, for that question. Yes, they are a high risk group. And actually, uh, Nakada will mention them under the maps, most at risk persons because of the issues I mentioned of low information access, low communication access, low language access. So because of language communication and information, they may just assume, you know, alcohol is a beverage. In any case, it's legal. For instance, if we talk about alcohol, we also do not have, I have actually never heard of any drug rehab that is fully disability inclusive. If anybody knows of any rehab in Kenya, let me know, uh, because we've had many, many instances where we've been looking for places where those who are suffering substance use disorders can actually get sign language uh, inclusive services. But so far, unfortunately, we do not have adequate programs like those. So yes, there's a high risk and there's low access, very little access to support for people with substance use disorders. Unfortunately, uh, the research is very recent. You might be able to Google and find a paper that was published in not less than the last five years. I have not come across any national study yet. So um, I do not have a specific statistics for that. Okay, thank you. And uh, one more question from uh, Leiti Mtange. 
what would you suggest as some of the basic things a mental health professional can do to equip themselves to be competent in dealing with deaf clients? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. So I would say four things. Reduce stigma. That's the first one. Everywhere you can, in whatever way you can, normalize it. So when people see people throwing hands in the air, they okay. say, oh, that person is bewitched, you know. So re reducing mm -hmm. stigma and mm -hmm. then uh, availing in inclusive information. So information in sign language, ensuring in your counseling office that all the information on all the pamphlets and in your online communication is inclusive. And then communication, just having uh, spaces for deaf people to talk. There's a model called social counseling that's very critical for deaf people. So whereby they just sit around a group and discuss basic information, including information on how to get information. All right. And then, of course, removing the language barrier by promoting Kenyan Sign Language, ensuring that in your counseling spaces, you are providing interpretation or an app, the apps that can be used for captioning. So this is just some few ways. But uh, ultimately, I'll be setting up a course this year. And I'm working in conjunction with Forum of African Psychology. We are setting up a deaf mental health course. So please keep in touch. And uh, I'll let you know if you'd like. Uh, I've done these courses many times before I've facilitated them, and I would like to do some more this year. So keep in touch if you have any further questions. Thank you. And uh, please give us any final comments and suggestions to improve on deaf mental health. Sure. So my doctoral dissertation research was on psychosocial support concerns and depression among deaf adults in Nairobi and Kajiado County. It is dedicated to all the Kenyan deaf community members. And I hope that I, I can join advocacy for the deaf community in Kenya and beyond. In uh, disability spaces, we talk of every intervention being by of, for, and with the people. So we cannot do this without uh, you know, the deaf people. So through my research, it was very clear to see the, the pain, the suffering, and the multiple challenges that the deaf face. So I hope that we can together provide better mental health services for deaf people, but also as professionals develop innovative therapeutic strategies to engage with the multiple pathways, as I mentioned earlier, the issue of intersectionality, the different ways that mental health problems would affect the deaf population. And lastly, let me end on a general note of optimism. Uh, I am really looking forward in this year, 2022, that we keep each other accountable and that like whatever you are doing, whatever research that you're doing, for you to consider having an element that makes it deaf inclusive. So um, I think I am very fortunate that I've connected with you and let's keep doing this together. Thank you. Welcome, welcome so much. Um, I'm happy, I've learned so much and uh, I hope our audience were able to learn uh, something. And uh, apart from that, I also want to uh, tell everyone, apart from being a special need uh, educator, I'm also a missionary. And uh, uh, I'm also having a project whereby we are fighting for the rights of uh, deaf persons here in Liberia. And if there's anyone who wants to support me or be part of the movement, they can always get in touch uh, with me through my uh, social media handles. And if you Google my name, uh, my full name is Mary Sharon Mwango, uh, you'll get all the information you need. And uh, once again, thank you to Ada Africa and also to our interpreter. Yeah, God bless you all and hope to see you again. Yeah. Thank you so much. I saw a question being sneaked in right now. Oh. Do we still have time? <laughs> okay, I didn't see that. <laughs> there are a few more in the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, there's one from Sharon. Uh, 
uh, shows, uh, thank you for the wonderful discussion on mental health among the deaf uh, on uh, flexibility. Uh, could you share how your hearing uh, status uh, and knowledge of KSL impacted your research process with the deaf community? Oh, thank you. That's a wonderful question on reflexivity, Sharon. And actually, methodology, I forgot to say, was one of the biggest outcomes of my research. Actually, out of all the findings, there was a surprise finding on how exactly to do research, clinical research with the deaf community. So my hearing status and my knowledge of KSL was a benefit. Feet. However, sometimes it was a burden because no, you are not deaf. You know, let us tell you what it is like to be deaf in Kenya, you know. So I would say that it really helped for me to have a research diary. So after every interview, I would actually write down my reflections on how my privilege as a hearing person might interfere with or affect the study. Since it was a mixed methodology, I was using both quantitative and qualitative methods. It was very important for me to keep checking how I am coming across and how you know my research is actually impacting people. So thank you for that. And then I see another question. I don't know what share with a counselor. What is your name, actually? <laughs> I see somebody is uh, telling me about an app coming up. I don't know what your name is. Please let me know your name. All right, uh, Sharon, any, anyone else? Oh, uh, um, I'm on the chats. I don't think they have any other question. Uh, All right, Judy, please share your, um, your link for your very wonderful uh, feature on KTN that was recently aired. Kindly, thank you, Judy Kihumba, sure. for being here. Yeah, sure, she's doing I'll, amazing I'll work it. with that <laughs> maternal mental health of deaf okay. mothers. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, for everyone uh, for attending this session, and uh, hoping to see you soon. Yeah, so we can leave at any time, or if you have any other question, you can remain behind for a few minutes. All right. Auntie Sana. Thank you. Happy New Year. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye, and thank you, our sign language interpreter, always for offering yourself. Yeah. So, uh, Letty, I had already shared the link. Let me share it again for my entire dissertation. But you can also join Journal Club. Uh, David has shared the link. Then I'll share my recording for my presentation. This is the PDF. It's long, <laughs> but the. PowerPoint presentation you can get if you join Journal Club. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I think that's it. Yeah, you thank you. The meeting. All right. So to access the recording, you need to join Journal Club. It will be shared there. So David, uh, let me see. David shared the links to join. So let me just. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, good. So I think Sharon, we may stop recording and close. Yeah, yeah exactly. Thank you.